morning. Welcome to our church this morning. I'm Nancy Rakoff, the membership coordinator of the Peoria UU Church. I would like to say I'm so glad to see you all, but unfortunately I can't see you all, but I'm glad that we're all participating here together. I'd especially like to welcome Reverend Martin Wolf, who has served as the minister of the Abraham Lincoln Unitarian Universalist Church in Springfield since 2003. Martin was raised in the south suburbs of Chicago and majored in creative writing and European history. He joined his first Unitarian Church of Chicago when he was 27. He earned a Master's in Divinity from Meadville Lombard Seminary and served as an interim minister before his current settlement. He was ordained in 2003. While in seminary, Mark, Martin worked at an emergency service shelter for abused and neglected youth. And after graduating from seminary, he and his wife, Angela, moved into a group home for troubled teens. Martin likes to call this his finishing school for ministry. His wife, Angela, is from Spain, and she works for the state of Illinois. They have one daughter, Celeste, who soon will be a senior at St. Louis University. Throughout his career, Martin has been active with local interfaith groups and social justice efforts, especially related to promoting racial understanding and LGBTQ issues. Like our church, the Abraham Lincoln UU Church in Springfield, during the pandemic, has gone to pre-recorded services. Martin has spoken in person, really, at our church in the past, and he and we all look forward to when we can get together in person again. Welcome, Martin Wolf. Good morning. My name is Martin Wolf, and I have the privilege of serving the Abraham Lincoln Unitarian Universe's congregation in Springfield. And as we have become accustomed over the past few months, this is a service which is being recorded in parts, actually in different places. And the good team in Peoria will splice it all together. And so without further ado, let me say that outside the sanctuary here, the corn is growing. It has been sunny, soggy at times, but indeed the corn is knee high at least. So we take that as an auspicious sign, which is good for the 4th of July weekend. And so in the spirit of the 4th of July, I commend to you these words written by Walt Whitman, entitled, I Hear America Singing. I hear America singing, the very carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his, as it should be blithe and strong. The carpenter singing his, as he measures his plank or beam. The mason singing his as he makes ready for work or leaves off work. The boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat. The deckhand singing on the steamboat deck. The shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench. The hatter singing as he stands. The woodcutter's song. The plowboys on his way in the morning or at noon intermission, or at sundown. The delicious singing of the mother, or of the young wife at work, or of the girl sewing or washing. Each singing what belongs to him or her, and to none else. The day what belongs to the day. At night, the party of young fellows, robust, friendly, singing with open mouths, their strong, melodious songs. In that spirit, I invite you to join us into the spirit of worship.
talk a little bit about history. You see, I believe that every person has a purpose, a unique effect on the world that touches history in some way. African American history is full of stories of people who never gave up and never stopped, but instead quietly always took the next step forward so that their children would be able to go farther and have better lives. Sometimes a person does something that is so extraordinary that they shape generations to come. My story today focuses on some amazing people that were of great importance in the fight for African American equality in our country. Our Children Can Soar by Michelle Cook. Our ancestors fought. So George could invent. George invented. So Jesse could sprint. Jesse sprinted. So Hattie could star. Hattie starred. So Ella could sing. Ella sang. So Jackie could score. Jackie scored. So Rosa could sit. Rosa sat. So Ruby could learn. Ruby learned. So Martin could march. Martin marched. So Thurgood could rule. Thurgood ruled. So Barack could run. Barack ran. So our children can soar and higher and faster and stronger they go. This story is a story for everyone. It reminds us that no one can make great changes alone. It takes many people rising together and building on each other's actions to change the world. There are many things that need to be changed for the better in our world. And as you use who try our hardest to respect all beings, offer fair and kind treatment to all, and insist on peace, freedom, and justice, we need to join with others to help our nation honor its promise of freedom and justice for all. Together, so be it. My name is Shar Ricky. As a representative from the Caring Committee, I'm here to share the joys and sorrows of our friends and members with you. We send congratulations to Nancy Sherman as she celebrates retirement from Bradley University after 28 years of employment, and to Jack Slickship as he welcomes his 12th grandchild, grandson Anton Mercari Slickship, born on June 27th into the family of Edward and Brandy Slickship. We send healing wishes to Helen Martin, who is home recovering from injuries she sustained in a fall and to Bridget O'Connor 
as she recuperates at home following open heart surgery, and to Chris Cole, who had surgery on June the 30th. We send caring and support to Sherry and Andy Shaw as they visit with Andy's mother, who is very ill. My family as well has had a sorrow this past week with the passing of my brother, Rick Schubach, on July 3rd, June the 30th after a short illness. Please hold these joys and sorrows in your hearts during the week ahead and remember that our community is filled with joys and sorrows, the joys made brighter and the sorrows made lighter by sharing them. If you have a joy or a sorrow you would like to share with us, please send a note to caring at caring at peoriauuchurch.org, call me at the number in the directory, or join us on Zoom Wednesday night at 7. Take good care. Our first reading this morning is It Matters What We Believe, which was composed by Sophia Lyon Foz, one of the early Unitarian women clergy. Some beliefs are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into a wider and deeper sympathy. Some beliefs are like shadows, clouding children's days with fears of unknown calamities. Other beliefs are like sunshine, blessing children with the warmth of happiness. Some beliefs are divisive, separating the saved from the unsaved, friends from enemies. Other beliefs are bonds in a world community where sincere differences beautify the pattern. Some beliefs are like blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. Other beliefs are like gateways, opening wide vistas for exploration. Some beliefs weaken a person's self selfhood. They blight the growth of resourcefulness. Other beliefs nurture self-confidence and enrich the feeling of personal worth. Some beliefs are rigid, like the body of death, impotent in a changing world. Other beliefs are pliable, like the young sapling, ever growing with the upward thrust of life. This morning, we are pleased to bring you a reading for two voices composed by Reverend Linda White, who of course have served the Peoria congregation for a number of years, and it was our privilege at the Abraham Lincoln Unitarian Universalist congregation to have her serve with us over the course of several years. And so this is entitled, King and Lincoln, Five Score and Four Score, arranged for two voices by Linda White, drawing from I Have a Dream by Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and the Gettysburg Address, President Abraham Lincoln. And joining me this morning is Penny Wallen to share one of the roles. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair, I say to you today, my friends. Now we are engaged in a great civil war. And so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. Testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. 
We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will be not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right here in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and the flesh shall see it together. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. This is our hope and this is the faith that I go back to the South with. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. With this faith, we would be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. And this will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. That from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. And when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. We are free at last. Good morning again. 
I have the privilege of serving a congregation named after Abraham Lincoln, one of the great presidents as we reckon them, a person who infused certain events throughout his tenure and his lifetime with a spirit of earnestness and decency, something to be celebrated on special holidays such as the 4th of July. Abraham Lincoln, in his inaugural addresses, in his Gettysburg Address, spoke to the heart of what is the American creed, a belief that this nation has been founded upon particular principles and purposes, that we are dedicated to propositions to uplift all, not just the select few, but that the goodness of this land, the benefits are for all within its borders. But we are reminded, especially during the spring and throughout the summer, that not all people have been welcomed equally into the American creed, let alone embrace the American ideal. Years and years ago, Langston Hughes wrote, I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. I think that those are very potent words for this particular 4th of July as we consider the waves of protests which have swept across this land and how there's been a convergence of peaceful protest against the death of various individuals, most recently George Floyd, but also Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Emmett Till, Brianna, and so many other individuals, so many other people who died violent deaths recently and not too recently because of the color of their skin. We know that in this town of Springfield that there was a terrible race riot in 1908. Several individuals were murdered people of color, killed, and at the root of that riot was a lie. Blood was shed here in Lincoln's hometown, and there were copycat riots spread like wildfire across these United States, from Chicago to Tulsa. Large segments of housing burned down, huge swaths of people forced to flee, a terrible crisis during various summers, while at the same time, almost without a sense of irony, many segments of the American population welcomed the 4th of July, welcomed this time of year to celebrate freedom. Indeed, as people of faith in the liberal tradition, we know that freedom and liberty are highly prized words within our tradition. To be a liberal, as we understand it, is to be a person who is open-minded, gracious, broad-minded, those who welcome others to be inclusive. This is a great aspiration, and indeed one of the hallmarks of this tradition that stretches back hundreds and hundreds of years. And we have told ourselves, as Sophia Lyon Foz reminded us in the reading, it is important what we believe. And so in many Unitarian Universalist congregations, for decades, especially since merger, we have celebrated the principles of religious freedom and liberty. And for many of us, especially in the earlier days of the movement, we understood that freedom was freedom to think and to choose our ideals to choose how we will believe, to choose the language that we will express those beliefs, to choose to subscribe or not to subscribe, and to take 
satisfaction in the knowledge that there was none who could compel us to do otherwise. We are reminded that such words as the word heretic is an old word that means literally to choose. And so we smiled at the word and called ourselves the happy heretics. But in the decades since the merger, we have now proceeded into the 21st century and we are being compelled to reevaluate our understanding of certain basic words like freedom and liberty and how it relates to our religious tradition. The protests of this spring and summer reinforce the urgency. We understand that the mission of Unitarian Universalism of this faith and of kindred faiths which are in alliance with us is not simply and solitarily to promote the freedom of thought, but to persuade us to use our gifts and our privileges, to use them as levers so that we might undo the bonds that are economic, political, and in terms of violence, which have been used for centuries to keep other peoples in bondage. We do have a very good track record, especially in recent years, of being mindful of those who have been LGBTQ and working for marriage equality. We worked very hard at that. We have understood that women have been kept in a place below the privileged male. We have understood that a cis white male, such as myself, has, despite whatever obstacles I or you may have had to face in life, still, when you compare that to the obstacles faced by a person of color, is quite different, and that we have had an easier time. For many of us, that has seemed an outrageous assumption to claim that knowing full well our own history and the history of our forebears, to say that we were people who enjoyed privilege. But as we consider other people's struggles, we are left with the conclusion that yes, indeed, in fact, our lives have been relatively easier. And then the question to us becomes, again, as people of faith, what to do? Do we retire to our libraries and reflect upon grand ideals? Do we read tomes and discuss amongst ourselves over coffee what are the perks and privileges of being a religious liberal? Or do we dare to pull ourselves out of this position of comfort and of privilege and to lift up other people, to take a step back and to let, let other voices fill the halls and to fill the arenas and to march side by side with our brethren, sisters and brothers, and especially women and people of color and to make a safe space for them to lift up their voices and their concerns, which we will discover may not always coincide exactly with our own. This has been a particular season to learn and to grow for me. I have participated in a number of rallies and protests here in Springfield, and I suppose that many of you have also done the same in Peoria or wherever you happen to be listening from. It is a season of stretching and growing. And it's not a comfortable place, especially for a white religious liberal. But we understand that our calling in this 21st century is to be not only an ally, as we understand it, but to work side by side and to be co-conspirators, is a happy phrase, with other people so that they can advance their own dreams. Over 50 years ago, Martin Luther King stood and he spoke eloquently about the need to urge his liberal peers to move, to act, rather than to caution and to ask his, uh, his brethren to wait. How long must we wait, he asked. Today, many people are saying, how long must we wait? And for many people, the answer is we've waited long enough. 
And this question and those answers are actually some of the deeper theological questions that have been asked throughout time and history in different traditions. You may know that in the Jewish tradition, the question has been asked, if I do not stand for myself, who do I stand for? And if I stand only for myself, what use is that? The same question must be asked of ourselves at this moment in history. We understand that this is a movement and that we are continuing to evolve as we understand not only the message, but the mission of Unitarian Universalism. And we understand that the pressures that have been felt so keenly by so many other people for generations is at a point that is at a breaking point. We have heard some people denounce those who protest, who have denounced the phrase Black Lives Matter and dismiss it as something treacherous, as something awful and evil. But those of us who have been involved in the liberation of other people as well as our own minds understand that this new calling is something sacred and that this is a new threshold of our understanding of Unitarian Universalism, which in fact intersects with the origins of our movement in the 1950s. Some of you will recall that in 1965, various Unitarian and Universalist clergy and lay people were called to Selma by Dr. King to agitate, 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 in the words of Frederick Douglass a century before, but to agitate and to show solidarity and by their presence to show a nation and a world that the white liberals stood by and marched and were willing to suffer outrageous, violent, outrageous violence that could be meted out by the law enforcement officials of that day. But they understood that the American creed as embodied in the Declaration of Independence, as well as the words of Dr. King, as well as in the words of Abraham Lincoln, were irresistible. And that we stand upon the threshold of a new birth of freedom. It has been a new birth delayed for well more than a century. And as we enter further into this weekend, recalling not just the glories, but also the unfinished task of the American Revolution and of the Civil War, that our destiny is bound up with so many others, and that we can respond to this call with, with full faith, with our hearts and minds, with our words, with our actions and maybe not complete the work, but to continue it, to further it, to rededicate ourselves and this movement. Your congregation, my congregation, and the other 1,000 Unitarian Universalist congregations across these United States, and all of our kindred allies from various denominations, to respond affirmative, with affirmation to that calling to support, to bless, to work, and to dedicate our lives, if need be, to this unfinished work so that all may be free, not just in thought, not just in mind, but in actuality in deed. I thank you very much for listening this morning, and I look forward to the next occasion when we can meet in person. Thank you. Again, it has been a great privilege to spend this time with you. For my closing words, I turn to the words of my colleague, Laura Lynn Bellamy, who wrote, If here you have found freedom, take it with you into the world. If here you have found comfort, go and share it with others. If you have dreamed dreams, help one another that they may come true. If you have known love, give some back to a bruised and hurting world. Go in peace. Amen and blessed be.
Thank you.